From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents William Powell and Claudette Colbert in The Ex-Mrs. Bradford. Lux presents Hollywood. Romance, laughter, and mystery are combined for your entertainment tonight in The Ex-Mrs. Bradford, starring Claudette Colbert and William Powell. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers, and between the acts, you'll meet the physician criminologist, Dr. Ronald W. McCorkle. Mr. DeMille steps to our microphone in just a moment. Meanwhile, a brief reminder to all the ladies listening in. Nine out of ten screen stars use Lux toilet soap. That certainly is significant. It means that the loveliest women in the world, the beautiful stars of the screen, to whom an attractive complexion is so necessary, use safe, gentle Lux toilet soap. I wonder if you found out what a luxurious, delightful aid to beauty this fine white soap is. And what a grand thing it is to make a daily beauty bath with this richly lathering white soap, a regular part of your beauty ritual. You'll be sure of daintiness and sure of skin that's sweet. Lux Toilet Soap has active lather that carries away every trace of dust and dirt and perspiration, leaves the skin fresh and soft, perfumed with a delicate clinging fragrance. And when you're tired, you'll find a beauty bath with this luxurious white soap just as relaxing, just as refreshing as a beauty nap. Try it, won't you? Ladies and gentlemen, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Cain and Abel were the principals in the first murder case recorded in history. In this country, the first murder mystery occurred in 1630. It was solved by the law and written off the books with a length of rope. The gentleman who paid the penalty was John Billington, who gained the dubious distinction of occupying the first hangman's noose in America. Since then, mystery has always had a particular attraction in this robust land, inspiring some of our greatest authors to write some of their greatest stories. Men like Washington Irving, Hawthorne, and Edgar Allan Poe. Tonight's play comes out of the school which they established, flavored with a modern touch of dry humor and sophisticated romance, and employs the distinguished talents of William Powell and Claudette Colbert. As Dr. Bradford, Mr. Powell repeats the part he played in the picture, and again as Dr. Bradford, he has the sympathy of all patient and obedient husbands who crawl out of bed in the middle of the night to assure their wives that the noise they hear is nothing more deadly than the dripping of a faucet. Likewise, all those good women who at least once in their lives have been able to say, I told you so, because it really was an intruder, will say it again with Claudette Colbert as Mrs. Bradford. Miss Colbert's latest picture is Metro Goldwyn Mayer's It's a Wonderful World. Mr. Powell's detective experience certainly qualifies him for the role of the unwilling Sherlock tonight. He created Philo Vance on the screen, was the Nick Charles of the Thin Man, and he appears through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer where he's preparing another Thin Man picture. Two feature players from the new RKO film, Career, also join our cast. John Archer as Nick Martell and Alice Eden as Mrs. Summers. And now, let's dust off our magnifying glass, put on our gum shoes, and raise the curtain in the Lux Radio Theater as we present the ex-Mrs. Bradford, starring Claudette Colbert and William Powell. the living room in the home of Dr. Bradford. It's just before dinner, and the prominent surgeon, sitting at ease in his favorite chair before a comfortable fire, listens to the news reports on the radio. As the butler enters, the doctor holds up his hand for silence. Yes, it was a strange tragedy that took the life of Eddie Sands today at the Imperial Racetrack. War cloud and luxury with Eddie Sands up were racing neck and neck down to the line of finish. Luxury was pulling away when suddenly Sands fell from the horse. The field doctors rushed to the jockey's side, but he was already dead. An examination disclosed that the famous little jockey had died of heart failure. News from Washington today is concerned All mainly right, Stokes, with the passage off. of a bill to regulate... Uh, what is it, Stokes? I beg your pardon, sir, but are you in? In? Why, yes, I think so. Oh, physically, of course, sir, but socially... Stokes, you bring up a very interesting point. If it's anybody I don't want to see, obviously I'm not in. Then, sir, you are not in. I shall tell her so at once. Don't bother, Stoke. Hiya, Brad. Paula. Brad, darling, kiss me. Uh, 
Paula, Dr. please. Dr. Bradford is not in, ma'am. Oh, I'm afraid it's too late, Stokes. Sorry, sir. Well, Paula, no one need to ask how you are. Oh, I feel grand. How are you, Brad? You look terrible. Well, I was all right. I thought you were in China. I hoped. Oh, Brad, I almost forgot. I brought someone with me. Come in, please. How are you? Brad, this is Mr. Frankenstein. Mr. Frankenstein, how do you do, sir? Are you Dr. Bradford? Yes. You're sure you're Dr. Bradford? Well, I don't know. I am Dr. Bradford, Paula. Yes, he's definitely Dr. Bradford. Then, Dr. Bradford, I hereby serve you with a subpoena to answer a suit for non-payment of alimony brought by Paula Bradford. Here you are. A subpoena? Well, for a minute, I was glad to see you, Paula. As for you, Mr. Frankenstein... Oh, am I going to be thrown out again? Stokes, show Mr. Frankenstein the door. Come along, sir. Now, Dr. Bradford, are you going to pay me my alimony or aren't you? A fair question, and it deserves a fair answer. In a word, no. Oh, yes, you are. The judge said so. Paula, I hate to introduce mundane matters into our idyllic relationship, but you already have about two-thirds of the money in California. Well, that has nothing to do with it. It's a matter of principle. You agreed to pay it, and I'm going to make you, if I have to spend all my own money doing it. Well, Stokes? Mr. Frankenstein has been thrown out. Hmm. Dinner is served. Dinner? Oh, how nice of you, Brad. Well, lay an extra place, Stokes. Yes, sir. And lock up the silver. Oh, it's been lovely, Brad. I don't know when I've enjoyed anything more. Very kind. You know, Brad, I've reached a great decision. I'm going to marry you again. Paula, that's the thing I love about you. You're so subtle. Oh, but you see, I'm doing it for your sake. Then you won't have to worry about the alimony. Mm, no, Paula. I think you're the swellest girl in the world. If we could have made a go of it, I would never let you divorce me. But our life together was intolerable. Oh, I thought it was fun. Fun? <laughs> you were making a nervous wreck of me. Almost had me convinced that the coffee always had poison in it. The scrambled eggs were always filled with ground glass. There were murders going on all around me. Oh, for an intelligent man, Brad, you have a very narrow mind. Now, I never have tried to interfere with your career as a surgeon. And you had no right to interfere with my career as a writer of mystery stories. Your writing of mysteries never bothered me. It was your insisting on living them that got me down. Do you realize that the last three months we were married, you kept me so busy running down clues that I spent more time in the morgue than I did in my office? And none of them were my patients either. I beat you to that one. Brad. What? Don't move. I'm not moving. Hey, what are you... Shh. Have you got a gun? What's the matter? What, what are you staring at? The wall behind you. In the living room. It's moving. Oh, is that all? Control yourself, Paula. Stokes! Yes, sir. All ready, sir. Never mind, Stokes. No movies tonight. No movies? Very well, sir. Well, well, what is this? All news since you've been here, Paula. That wall moves a few feet from the left. And that hole you see up there is our projection booth. <laughs> what have you done? Turn this place into a neighborhood movie? Oh, it's just that Stokes and I don't like standing in line. We find this much simpler. Oh. Say, Brad, speaking of murders... Which we weren't. Uh, speaking of murders, that was a marvelous setup at the racetrack this afternoon. Oh, you mean Eddie Sands? Yes. Oh, what a melodrama. Hmm? Uh, an unfortunate accident, Paula, not melodrama. Not melodrama? You're crazy. Well, think of it. The horses thundering down the stretch. Luxury the favorite, 12 lanes in the lead. Millions of dollars riding on his nose. The villain hidden behind the three-quarter pole with a rifle with a Maxim silencer. He shoots. The jockey falls. My dear uh, ex-wife. Luxury wasn't 12 lengths in the lead. There was no rifle fired. The jockey was not shot. The coroner said it was heart failure. Well, I don't quite see how... Excuse me, sir. Yes, Stokes? Mr. North is here, sir. North? Well, this is a coincidence. Send him in. Hello, Doc. Hello, Mike. Say, I'm awfully sorry about this afternoon. Uh, oh, this is Mrs. Bradford. Glad to know you. Oh, I didn't know you were married, Doc. I'm not. We're going to be. Oh, no, we're not. <laughs> Uh, sit down, Mike. Paula, Mr. North is the trainer of luxury. He's the man who taught Eddie Sands everything he knew. Oh, well, we were just talking about the murder of that poor jockey this afternoon. What? Well, what do you know about it? He was murdered, wasn't he? Yes, he was. What? You see, Brad, I told you. But the report was heart failure, Mike. Doc, you examined Eddie not two weeks ago. Did you ever see a finer boy? Was there anything the matter with his heart? No. That's why I couldn't understand. Say, have you uh, been to the police with this, Mike? No. This is my job. Mr. North, did, did any have any enemies? Some organization of spies, possibly, Paula, that would... will you shut up? 
What makes you so sure it was murder, Mike? Jockeys have fallen from horses before, you know. Yeah, but Eddie was dead before he fell. How do you know that? The boy didn't have a bone broken, Doc. You don't fall limp and relax like that if you're conscious. Then I found this note in his locker after the race. Oh, please, let me see. You do as I've told you. Keep your mouth shut. No one would take your word against mine. Who wrote this, Mike? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. And you're going to help me. I want you to examine Eddie's body. Oh, that won't be necessary. The coroner will perform an autopsy and... and I want you to examine it, Doc. Oh, of course he'll do it, Mr. North. We... Here we go again. Well, all right, Mike, I'll examine the boy if that'll make you any happier. Thanks, Doc. You keep the note. I'm going to do a little scouring around on my own. I'll meet you back here later. So long, Doc. Uh, about 10.30, Mike. Right. Oh, Brad, isn't it exciting? I'll go get my wrap. Paula, we're not going to a party. In fact, we're not going anywhere. I'm going to the morgue. Well, what a coincidence. That's where I'm going. Right down this way, Doctor. Thank you. You know, Brad, this doesn't look at all like a morgue. You know why? We're not in the morgue yet. It's behind that door. Oh. Paula, will you please go home? No. Look, this is definitely no place for a woman. All right. I'll make you a proposition. If I don't go in, will you marry me again? No. Then in we go. Open the door, please. Hey, yes, ma'am. <gasps> oh. Paula. Paula? Oh. Uh, Joe. Here? Yeah? My assistant has just resigned. Would you mind getting her out of the air? Oh, sure. You know, my wife's the same way. Least little thing frightens her. <clears throat> Find anything, Doc? I don't see anything out of line here. There's not a mark on the boy. He couldn't... Now, wait a minute. Uh, let me have a scalpel, will you? Yeah. you Something on his back here. A little scraping. Hmm. What do you make of that? Could it be chewing gum? It could be, but I'd be very much surprised. Let me have a tube with this scalpel, will you? I'll examine what's on it when I get home. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Stokes. What's that package on the table? It's for Mr. North, sir. Delivered an hour ago. Mr. North? Why was it left here? I don't know, sir. Hmm. All right, give it to me. Yes, sir. Now, sir, I regret to tell you that... I'll uh... have to wait, Stokes. Oh, but Dr. Bradford, I must tell you that... Hello? Hello, Doc. This is Mike North. Oh, uh, how are you, Mike? I say, a Mr. Pa... Doc, did a package come for me? Why, yes. Okay, keep it for me. I'll be there in five minutes. I've got something very hot. All right, Mike. Dr. Bradford, I regret to tell you that... Please, Stokes, not now. But Dr. Bradford, Later. I, uh, 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 I'm going to be busy. Hello, darling. What? <laughs> What's all this luggage in here? That's what I was trying to tell you. So, wait a minute. What is this, Paula? What are all these grips? Oh, did I forget to tell you, dear? I'm moving in. You... Oh, now, Paula. This is ridiculous. All that this means is that I'll have to move out. You'll do nothing of the kind. You're my bread and butter, Brad, either by marriage or alimony. And the only way you're any good to me is alive. Now you've got yourself mixed up in a murder case. Against my advice, mind you. And it wouldn't surprise me if you got bumped off unless I look after you. Paula, you're a menace to civilization. I'm very serious, Brad. You've got to exercise every precaution. Don't eat anything unless you've had it tested. Don't open a door. And above all, never go anywhere alone. Not that you'll have much chance to. Yes, I can understand that. Hello? Hello, Dr. Bradford? Yes? Well, this is Mike North, Doc. Mike? Yeah. Look, Doc, did a package arrive for me? Why, you just... Huh? Uh... Yes. Yes, it came. Okay, look. Look, I'm in a spot. I need help. Will you come right over to the cigar store at Wilshire and Weston? I'll wait here for you. Uh, yes. Yeah, sure, Mike. And bring the package with you. Okay, Mike. Goodbye, Mike. Well, I guess that was Mike. And that's where you're wrong, my sweet. That wasn't Mike. It was someone pretending to be Mike. Oh, what did he say? He wanted me to meet him with this package. What's in it? I don't know. Let me see. No, no, no. Don't, don't do that. Oh, now, Brad, let me alone. Okay, now, give me the package. No, will you please let go? I want to see what's in it. Listen, Paula, you should... Oh, Brad, it's money. Money? Scared of it. Isn't it beautiful? Sixty, seventy, eighty, a hundred thousand dollars. And you were just going to walk out with that and get clunked over the head by a phony Mike North. Well, it's a lucky thing I'm here, Dr. Bradford. 
Yes, very. Now, listen carefully, Stokes. It was a scalpel, a little knife, and it had a little gummy substance on the blade, and I left it right here on my little desk last night. Now, do you understand? Yes, sir. Well, where is it? I don't know, sir. It must have disappeared. It... Well, all right, never mind. Has Mr. North called yet? No, sir. Did you try to reach him? Yes, sir. His phone doesn't answer. Try him again. Yes, sir. Did you call those other numbers I gave you? Yes, sir. No one has seen Mr. North since early last evening. Hello? One moment, please. I'll take it. Hello, Mike? Yes. Hello? Is this, is this Mike North? Yes, this is Mike North. <laughs> Who's this? Yes. Oh, Paula. What are you doing over there? Where's Mike? That's fine. When I see him, I'll tell him you're looking for him. Well, well, well. Young Lockenbaugh home from the ward. Bust me, luck, old boy. Consider yourself bust, toots. Oh, you look tired. I am. Six operations in one day. Hmm. Yeah, but come on, put this on. My smoking jacket. Say, where did that come from? Well, I've hunted everywhere. Well, that... you're going to dig into my girlish heart. That has been in Honolulu, Bali, China, and points west. It went with me. Well, confidentially, I've missed you both. Uh, hey, we're on the verge of getting sentimental. <laughs> Don't if we're not. How about some dinner? Well, it stokes his day off. Now, if you were the right kind of an ex-wife, you'd have dinner ready at home. But as it is... As it is, I am the right kind of an ex-wife, and I've got dinner ready at home. Are you serious? Anytime I fix dinner at home, it's serious. Look in there. <laughs> oh, Paulie, you're swell. You know, it's little touches like this that make a man appreciate a woman about the house. Coming home tired and sitting down for a good dinner. Hmm. This is... Hey. What is it? What's the matter? Everything looks like jelly. No, darling, Gelatin. Jellied consomme, aspic salad, chicken and jelly. Oh, go on. I get the idea. It's all gelatin. Well, now, stop complaining. Try some of that jellied consomme. Mm. You find Mike? No. Well, neither did I. Brad, please, let's not talk about detecting, hmm? Let's just have a nice, quiet evening for once. The ex-Bradford's at home. Now, how do you feel? All right. Funny, so do I. Here, try some of that chicken in aspic. Mm, thanks. How do you like it? Mm, all right. Mm-hmm. Sleepy? No, not particularly. Well, neither am I. I'm not even dizzy. Well, that's something. <laughs> Paula, what are you doing? I always rub gelatin on my arm. Here, put some on your face. It feels good. Uh, do I look all right? You look pretty silly to me. Well, hold out your hand. What for? Hold it out. All right, now what? There. A little gelatin on the hand is good for you. Oh, thank you, Paula. Thank you very much. Now, hang on to it. I can't. It oozes out. <laughs> Do you still feel all right? Paula, I feel fine, except I'm getting mad. Oh. Well, it's very funny. We ought to be dead. What? What was in that stuff? Just gelatin, but it should have killed us. Paula, you're crazy. They feed that stuff to babies. It may be all right for babies, but it killed Eddie Sand. That's what was on the scalpel. The scalpel? What do you know about the scalpel? Oh, I took it. Didn't you know? Oh, heaven give me strength. Well, certainly. I took it over at the laboratory last night and had it analyzed. It was just gelatin. Paula, you're sensational. For a while, you had me interested in this detecting business. If someone else had stolen the scalpel and... But no, you took the scalpel. Then proved that the poison was not poison. Which very effectively ruins any help I could have been to Mike North. Except finding him... And we are now going to let the police worry about that. Oh, I think you're a sissy calling the cops. There's something very strange about Mike. I want to know what's become of him. Who could that be? Wait here, Paula. No, no, no. I, I want to see. Go on, beat it now, will you? No, beat it. Wait, Brad. What? Listen to that bell. Uh, just a minute. Brad, don't open the door. Just look out the peephole. Paula, will you? Oh, but you don't know who it might be. Please, look out the peephole. All right, get away. Who is it? Who's out? What do you see? That's funny. The man has his back up against the door. He's leaning on it. Get away, Paula. What are you going to do? I'm going to open it. Oh! Get away. Oh, 
Get away. Trapped. Who is it? Oh, why did he lie there like that? It's Mike Noah. Mike? He's been shot through the forehead. Is he dead? Yes. Fred, th there's a note on his sleeve. What does it say? This guy wouldn't turn over the money uh, either. That was Act One of The Ex-Mrs. Bradford. In a few moments, William Powell and Claudette Colbert will return for Act Two. Meanwhile, in this short intermission time, let's look in on a family scene. Why, Sue, dear, what energy. Must you play the piano before you even take your hat and coat off? <laughs> oh, I don't know, Mother. I, I just feel so good today. <laughs> Bet you I know why. Bet you I know why. It's because she's got a date with John Lane tonight. <laughs> oh, Mother, make him stop oh, it. Oh, so that explains it. Yes, Sue has a date tonight, and she's happy, as girls are when they're popular and sought after. Sue isn't beautiful, but she's lovely to look at because she has the charm of smooth, radiant skin. She's clever, too. She doesn't risk spoiling her good looks. She cares for her complexion the Hollywood way with gentle Lux toilet soap. It has active lather that removes dust, dirt, stale cosmetics thoroughly. It helps guard against choke pores, the choke pores that cause unattractive cosmetic skin, dullness, tiny blemishes, enlarged pores. Use cosmetics all you like. But use Lux toilet soap regularly, as nine out of ten lovely women of the screen do, as lovely women all over the country do. Use this gentle soap before you renew makeup during the day, always before you go to bed at night. Here's Mr. DeMille. The Lux Radio Theater brings you the second act of The Ex-Mrs. Bradford, starring Claudette Colbert in the title role and William Powell as Dr. Bradford. <laughs> A few minutes have passed. Just inside the door of Bradford's home, Mike North lies on the floor. Inspector Corrigan and his staff have arrived. Flash bulbs are exploding and fingerprints are being taken as the machinery of the law gets underway. Suddenly, the inspector turns to Bradford and eyes him coldly. All right, Doc, why did you kill him? Why did... <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. What would I kill him for? What? Ah, there you got me. But if you didn't, how did his body get here? I don't know. I saw someone leaning against the door. I opened it, and his body fell into the room. Mm hmm. Pretty good man that can walk up to a door and ring the bell after he's dead. Now, just a minute, Inspector. Why would I kill Mike North? Oh, I don't know. But look, Doc, you've been a mighty suspicious character these last 24 hours. Mighty suspicious. First of all, we got a report that you visited the morgue last night. You found something on Eddie Sand's body and took it away with you. Now, what was it? Well,. It turned out to be gelatin. Gel? Well, that makes as much sense as the coroner's report. He performed an autopsy on the body and says the left ventricle was completely collapsed. Left ventricle collapsed? Well, that's funny. That's symptomatic of drowning or strangulation. Kind of cockeyed, ain't it? Drowning, strangulation, or gelatin? Why did you go down there, Doc? Because of Mike Knorr. He came to me. Yeah, and I... that brings me to another interesting point. We just sent a man down to his hotel, and he found this. A woman's purse. You recognize it? No. That's funny. It's your wife's. Now, look, Doc, there's no sense kidding you. You're in a tough spot. I'm beginning to think you're right. Yes, I'd say you were in a tough spot, Brad. You're now public suspect number one. You've got to find the murderer to clear yourself. Which is exactly what I'm going to do. You won't find him on the sports page. Paula, I don't want to tell you your business, but in most murders, the motive is money. Now, who stood to make the most out of yesterday's race? The owner of the winning horse? Exactly. See here? Sixth race, winner, war cloud. Owner, Leroy Hutchins. Odds, four to one. Hutchins? That's the man who called Mike last night. What? Yes, I found slips at Mike's place this morning. He had three calls last night. Hutchins, John Summers, and Nick Martell. In case of fire, run. Do not walk to the nearest exit. Where are you going? Find out who killed Eddie Sands. Brad, you're working on the wrong murder. It's Mike North they think you killed. Paula, it should be obvious even to you that if Mike was killed, it was because he had confirmed his suspicions about yesterday's race and was coming close to the murderer. 
So if I can follow Mike's trail last night... No, wait a minute. If you find out what he did, you may get bumped off, too. Maybe. Tell Corrigan I'll be back soon. Brad! Oh, Brad, come back. If you're going to be killed, I want to be there. <laughs> Now, Mr. Hutchins, I'm going to be very frank with you. I'm investigating yesterday's race. I see. Investigating for the track officials? I'm sorry, Mrs. Hutchins, but I can't tell you that. Tell me, Mr. Hutchins, what sort of a trainer is Mike Noah? Well, one of the main reasons I wanted to buy the summer staples was because Mike would go with it. Oh, then the deal didn't go through? No. Summers wanted 20000 extra for luxury, and I couldn't see it. It's very interesting. Will you have one of these cakes, Doctor? They're very good. Hmm? Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> well, is that, uh, is that what you called Mike about last night, Mr. Hutchins? Oh, you're mistaken, Doctor. I didn't call him. I saw him at Summer's house. Hmm, I see. Hmm. These cookies are good. <laughs> what are they? Oh, a little idea of my husband's. A gelatin filling. Uh... <coughs> well, that's a very cute colt, Mr. Summers. I'll buy him from you right now. Sorry, I never sold one of my horses in my life, sick or sound. Oh, I thought you were considering selling your stables. I? Of course not. I've told my trainer, Mike North, not even to bother me with any offers. Really? Won't you come into the house, Doctor? Oh, no, no, I feel right at home here. You see, Mrs. Summers, I'm investigating yesterday's race. You mean Eddie's death? Yes. Oh, I... I'm sorry. John, you explain... Excuse me. We were both very fond of Eddie, Doctor. His death was a terrible shock to us. But to her, particularly. Yes, I can understand that, of course. I imagine Mike was upset, too. Very. Is that why he came here last night? Last night? Oh, yes. And uh, to pay me some money he owed me. Oh. Suppose he made a killing at the track yesterday? Oh, he couldn't have done that. Luxury lost. But he might have bet on War Cloud. Dr. Bradford, I resent that implication. My trainer is an honest man. I'm sorry. Well, thanks for your help, Mr. Summers. Oh, about time you got home. What did you find out, Brad? <sighs> that I'm not a detective. I've dug up a lot of very promising suspects from whom I've gathered a very interesting array of complete misinformation. But which are lies and which aren't, I don't know. Look, Brad, stop worrying. I've got an idea. Yeah, which will probably mean I get in more trouble. No, now, don't be silly. We've overlooked our most important clue, the note. Holy... You're right, Paul, of the note. That threatening note that was sent to Eddie Sands. So all we've got to do now is find which one of those men wrote it, and we've got the murderer. Who do you suppose that is? There's only one way to find out. How? I'll open the door. Oh, Mr. Bradford... I'm sorry to... Well, hello. Hello again, Mrs. Summers. Won't you come in? I hate to bother you, Doctor, but... Oh, I beg your pardon. Well, not at all. Uh, Mrs. Summers, uh, Mrs. Bradford. How do you do, Mrs. Summers? How do you do? Dr. Bradford, could you... I mean, if I could see you alone? Of course. Uh, in my office? No, no, don't bother. I'll go. Oh, thank you, Paula. Well? Doctor, where is Mike North? Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I can't tell But you. I've got to find him. Mrs. Summers... You evidently want me to help you. How about your helping me? How? Did you talk to Mike North last night? Yes, at my house. What about? About a threatening note Eddie received before the race. Mike told me he'd given it to you. And if you think Eddie was killed, you must think that the person who wrote that note... Is the murderer. Exactly. You see, I wrote it. Well, is this a confession? Oh, no. I promise you that note had nothing to do with it. What did it mean, Mrs. Summers? This isn't very easy to say, Doctor. But I've been a very stupid woman. My husband was suspicious. Eddie knew that there was someone else. Eddie loved my husband as he would a father and out of loyalty to him threatened to tell him. I wrote Eddie that note and he died. And so you see, the note must be destroyed. Please give it to me, I promise you. Well... Don't be a sap, Brad. Paula, will you please... Give me that note. What do you want it for? Now, don't argue. Just give it to me. Uh, now, Mrs. Summers, will you please write? Write what? On this pad. Write, you do as I tell you and keep your mouth shut. Now, give me the pad. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's the same writing. 
Well, I just had to make sure you weren't protecting somebody mm, else. Good girl. Here's your note, Mrs. Summers. Bless you both. I'm so grateful. Oh, don't mention it. Brad, Brad was glad to do it. Good night. Hey, good night, Mrs. Summers. Well, that got us a long way. I can feel the noose around my neck right now. Brad, what's the name of that bookie you used to know? Bookie? Why? Oh, um, Nick something. Nick Martell? That's it, Martell. What's he got to do with it? Oh, nothing, except that Mrs. Summers mentioned something about her husband being suspicious. Well? And this afternoon, I saw her and Martell together at the Hillsgate Bar. You did? She and Martell? Mm -hmm, I'm sure of it. They sat right next to me, and Martell was yelling about losing a lot of money when War Cloud won. Which means somebody placed a big bet with him. So long, Paula. Well, wait a minute now. Where are you going now? I'm going to call on Mr. Martell. And I hope he isn't home. I'd like to take a look at the records in his safe. All right, fellow. Get away from that safe. Oh. Hello, Nick. I, I didn't expect you. Yeah, I hardly thought you would. Didn't know you went in for opening safes, Doc. Oh, we surgeons open anything. Hmm. Very funny. Keep your hands up. Didn't think you'd find North in there, did you? I found him, Nick. Not here. He's dead. Well, Murdered. that figures. You start double-crossing it. Do they know who did it? The police think I did. No kidding. Huh. You're certainly behind the eight ball. On the spot with the cops and with me. Look, Nick. They hang people in this state for murder. And I have no intention of being hanged if I can avoid it. If the only way out for me is to pass the buck to someone else, I'm going to pass it. Well, you can't get ruled off for trying. I can do better than try, Nick. I have an appointment with Corrigan in the morning. I can tell him a lot of interesting things. Oh, <laughs> you kill me, Doc. Why, what makes you think you're going to see Corrigan in the morning? Or anybody else? Yes, there's that to consider. Well, shall I answer? Get back over there. Certainly. Hello? Oh, yeah. Yeah, wait a minute. It's Corrigan. For you. Corrigan? Well? Tell him everything's all right, Bradford. Is it? Yeah. Hello, Inspector. Hello, Bradford. I've got everything under control here. <coughs> How are you doing? Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, Inspector. <coughs> everything's fine, Oh, uh, yes. Uh, oh, yes, I'll be there. Bye. All right, Doc, you win. For the time being. Thanks. Don't thank me. Thank your friend Corrigan. Now that you've seen my books, you understand how I felt about Mike North. A heel, rest his soul in peace. Oh, sure. But I'm still a little puzzled. Can't you read? Look, Mike North. He bet 25 grand on War Cloud to win. Paid off at four to one. And I'm stuck for 100 grand every cent I own. That's what I don't understand. You knew Mike was betting on War Cloud. You must have known that Luxury couldn't win. Ah, uh, Mike didn't make the bet himself. He was too smart for that. Sent some guy to place the bet. Who was he? Search me, some little guy with a scar on his face. He was going to call me after the race and tell me where to send the winning. And did he? Sure, he said to send it to Mike North. Apartment K, 717, Kosciuszko Street. But Mike lived at the Hotel Merton. Ah, uh, I know that. He was using this other address as a blind. But I wanted to tell Mike myself what I thought of him. So I phoned his hotel and he came over here. What did he say? What do you suppose? Tried to bluff me. Said he never made the bet. Why would he do that? Uh, search me. But when I told him about the little guy with the scar, he came through quick enough. Took the dough and beat it. Western Union, please. Where were you supposed to send the money? Apartment K, 717, Kosciuszko Street. Hello? I want to send a telegram, please. This is Beacon, 7942. The message is to Dr. Lawrence Bradford. 614 Harlan, Harlan Drive, City. Meet me in my apartment, 717 Kosciuszko Street. Signed, Mike North. Mm, what's the idea of that? Oh, just in case I'm not around in the morning. I want Corrigan to know where I am. Is that you, Brad? Come on in. Paula. What are you doing here? Oh, I read that phony telegram you sent yourself. I knew you wouldn't let me come down here, so I sealed it up again and came anyway. How did you get in? 
If you're going to keep on housebreaking, Doctor, you should never be without a hairpin. Hmm. Now, what did we come down here for? A quick look around, and then you're going to get out. I don't like I... the looks of this place. Well, it's very cozy. Now, here's all I've been able to find. A box of pills. Capsules. They're so big, I don't see how a person could swallow one. Mike didn't give medicine to people, Paula. And horses have very big throats. But Mike never lived here. How do you know? Well, I asked the janitor. He said the fellow that had this room had a scar on his face. A scar? Mm-hmm. He said... Paula, he... I've got it. Got what? Look. Martell claims that Mike North made a bet on War Cloud, but he didn't. And he didn't rent this apartment either. It was the little fellow with a scar pretending to me, Mike. He had it all worked out. Martell was supposed to send the winnings to this address. And the little fellow would have got them. But Martell gummed it up by calling Mike, the real Mike, and giving the money to him. That's how Mike found out about this place, and... Paula, move. Oh, for heaven's sake, what is this? Spider, just over your head. Oh, oh, thanks. Well, then, it was the little fellow that was pretending to be Mike that killed him and called you. It's obvious. Paula, it must be obvious that you got it. Now, all we've got to do is to find him, and we've got the murderer. Oh, well, there's no use staying down here. I've looked all over the place. Still, you know, there's one thing very funny about it. What? There isn't any bed. Can you imagine running a room without a bed? My dear protected Paula, have you ever heard of a wall bed? Oh, oh, that's right. Well, where is it? Right in the wall, there. Take it down, hmm? What for? I, I want to look under it. <laughs> <laughs> Very well, my sweet. Now you can look to your heart's <gasps> Look out! Who is it? I don't know. Judging from that scar on his face, he's our murderer. But, Brad, he's dead. Not a mark on him, as far as I can see. Paula, run down to the corner and phone Corrigan. Get here just as fast as he can. Well, go on. What are you standing there for? Brad, behind you, the window's open. There's a hand there with a gun. Now, listen, Paula. But don't get R down, Brad. Please. <laughs> Identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. William Powell and Claudette Colbert continue shortly in the ex Mrs. Bradford. Our brief pause between the acts tonight brings you an unusually interesting intermission guest. But before he appears, I'd like to say just a word or two to you ladies. May I tell you something frankly? If you neglect your skin, if you go to bed at night with stale cosmetics, dust and dirt, not thoroughly removed, you're running the risk of seeing your skin grow dull, unattractive. But if you use Lux Toilet Soap regularly, you are helping your complexion to stay smooth and radiant, lovely to look at and soft to touch. So use Lux Toilet Soap before you renew makeup, always before you go to bed at night. Don't risk spoiling the natural soft beauty of your skin. It needs the thorough, gentle cleansing <clears throat> Lux Toilet Soap's active lather gives. Begin tonight to use the soap the screen stars use. Then use it regularly. You'll discover very soon what a really fine complexion soap can do for your skin, for your charm, for you. Our producer, Mr. DeMille. Our special guest is a practicing physician in Hollywood who, like Dr. Bradford, is also a detective. Dr. Ronald W. McCorkle is a family doctor who also spends many thrilling hours looking through a microscope to see whether two bullets match or tensely watching a test tube while a blood precipitant test is underway. For 20 years, the police have consulted him in major criminal cases. And we'd like to know, Dr. McCorkle, how a physician like you became a criminologist. It was mostly a hobby in the beginning, Mr. DeMille. I became interested in criminology just as someone else might take up skeet shooting or stamp collecting. Now it's part of my profession. Well, the layman respects the criminologist's positive identification of bullets or fingerprints, but he always has a suspicion in the back of his mind that you may be wrong. What are the chances of your being wrong? It would be practically impossible to be wrong on a fact like a bullet or a fingerprint identification, although, of course, anyone can make wrong deductions from a fact. Take a concrete example. Suppose when the third act of this play begins, we find Dr. Bradford on the floor with a bullet in his body. 
Suppose the police find a man running away from the house with a gun in his pocket. Well, how would you prove that the bullet in Bradford's body came from that man's gun? We fire another bullet from the gun, then compare this bullet with the one removed from Dr. Bradford's body under a comparison microscope, one through which one can look at two objects at once. The chances of such an examination giving the wrong answer are roughly one in a trillion or so. Huh. Does, a, does a scientific criminologist go to the scene of the crime, or does he usually stick to his laboratory? Both. In fact, certain police departments now use traveling laboratories for immediate investigation. When he arrives, I suppose the traditional thing is for him to pick up the gun with his handkerchief and put it in his pocket? Mr. DeMille, I'm looking for a movie or a mystery story where the detective does not pick up the gun with his handkerchief. Actually, that would erase fingerprints, almost as effectively as wiping the gun. The proper way is to pick up the gun by placing a pencil through the trigger guard where the criminal would not have left his prints. But yet, better yet, tie an identification tag to the trigger guard and pick up the gun by the string. However, I don't recall a major case in many years which has been solved by means of fingerprints on a gun. They're usually wiped off or smudged. The fingerprints that catch criminals are the ones he leaves on furniture or glass and forgets about. Well, doesn't scientific criminology also play a part in the defense of persons accused of crime? Yes, that's becoming more important. Twenty years ago, I was unable to establish the innocence of two boys accused of murder. A blood-stained knife found near a man who had been stabbed to death was traced to these boys. They said they had been hunting and had used the knife for dressing birds. There weren't any feathers on the blade, so their story seemed doubtful. I used a new test just then being developed and established that it was the blood of a bird and not of a human. A few months later, a man confessed to the crime. Mm. Tell me, Doctor, have you got a case under consultation now? Yes, there's one I expect to solve very shortly. Mm, a murder case? Quite the contrary. I expect to pay a visit with a stork any moment now. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> DeMille. <laughs> Don't forget to think of Prince of Avery. Claudette Colbert and William Powell in Act Three of The Ex-Mrs. Bradford. Miraculously escaping the assassin's bullets, the two amateur sleuths made their way safely home from the apartment. It's morning. Dr. Bradford, suffering only from a slight graze along the side of his head, lies asleep on the couch. Paula, in a traveling dress, bends over him and speaks sadly. Goodbye, Brad. Hmm? What's the matter? What, what's going on? I just came in to say goodbye. Where, where are you going? I don't know. Oh, Brad, I'm so sorry. Well, that's fine. Sorry for what? Well, this. It's all my fault. I got you into it. I thought it was going to be fun, but when you got hurt... Oh. Well, I'm wrong, that's all. I'm getting out. You won't be bothered with me anymore. Not even the alimony? Oh, Brad, that was just a gag to get near you again. Well, it worked. Will you marry me again, Paula? Well, oh, lie down, dear. You've got a fever. Getting shot, even grazed, often makes people delirious. I'm all right. I mean it, Paula. I've been a chump. I found that out as soon as I let you go. And when you came back, well... There it is. I want you to stay. Well, what do you say? Will you marry me? Dr. Bradford, in a word, yes. What in the world are you doing? Packing for our wedding trip. What's all this junk on the floor? Oh, just some things I figured on using for murder mysteries. Uh, this was the crowbar mystery. Nothing more mysterious than a crowbar. Uh, this was the life preserver mystery. Oh, yes. That ought to drown a man very nicely. What are these? Oh, that was the cutest idea I ever had. A mystery for children. Murder with toys. I still think if it had worked, it would have been a great idea. Who? Oh, what's this? A toy spider. It's in the wrong box. That was another story I See, had. Give me that. Well, don't lose it. I may use it yet. Look, I killed a spider at Kosciuszko Street last night. What else did we find there? A wall bed. Wall bed. Oh, that's no good. <gasps> I've got it. Capsules. Capsules are gelatin. Paul, I've been blind. I had it in front of me all the time and I couldn't see it. Paula, get me those capsules. Right away. Inspector Corgan is here, sir. Good morning, Doc. Yeah, you're looking pretty lively for a man who's almost dead. How are you, Inspector? Sit down. Thanks. Oh, this is Mr. Curtis, president of the jockey club. How do you do, Mr. Curtis? Uh, how do you do? Here you are, Brad. The capsule. Oh, hello, Inspector. Good morning, Mrs. Bradford. 
Well, Doc, we performed an autopsy on Lou Pender. That's a little fellow with a scar. Exactly the same symptoms as Eddie Sands. Left ventricle collapsed. As soon as I saw there was some connection between his death and Eddie's, I notified Mr. Curtis here. This has been a terrific shock to me, Doctor. Horse racing is a clean sport, and we intend to keep it so. I'm sure you will, Mr. Curtis. Now, I have something really interesting to show you and the inspector. What does that look like? Why, a toy spider in a capsule. Something much more dangerous than that. Now, I light a match. Place it under the capsule. The capsule melts. Now, what do you see? A toy out of a capsule. No, you don't. That is a weapon. The weapon with which Eddie Sands and Lou Pender were murdered. What? That's a black widow spider, Inspector. The murderer put the spider in a capsule, which was then placed on the victim's body. I've used a match so as not to waste time, but body heat, particularly at a time of excitement, would melt the capsule, leaving the spider free to bite. A black widow spider? It explains everything, Inspector. The collapse of the left ventricle, the symptoms of strangulation or drowning. Well, that's a new one on me. Now all you've got to do is to catch this spider breeder the next time he goes to work. The next time? Say, wait a minute. Is this going to be an epidemic? Well, he has to commit at least one more murder. Uh, I'm sorry, Doctor, but I don't understand. Well, I beg your pardon. I thought the inspector would have explained everything to you. You see, Mr. Curtis, the murderer was working to get money. That's why he bet on war cloud, an outside chance. And then murdered the favorite's jockey, Eddie Sands. Thank you, Paul. Mike North was suspicious of the whole affair. Started investigating. He got too close for comfort, so the murderer killed him. Thank you, Paula. Then Lou Pender, who was working in cahoots with him, knew too much. Mm-hmm. So he polished Lou off just as he did Eddie Sands. Thank you, Paula. Go on, dear. That's as far as I can go. Oh. Well, anyhow, Inspector, the only fly in his ointment is that he still needs money. Not only has he not won his bet... But he's lost the $25,000 he put up the day before yesterday. So the murderer must strike again, hmm? Inspector, the case in a capsule. Then, then that means the same thing is likely to happen at the track at any time. But that's what we've been explaining to you. Inspector, you've got to stop this thing. It, it might happen again today. The Barton Handicap, the Luxury and War Cloud are entered. Well, there you are, gentlemen. Get going, Inspector. Yeah, but where? Where would you suggest? You'll have to catch the murderer. I've got other work to do. I should say he has. We're going to get married. Huh? Oh, that'll have to wait, Paula. What? I've got to save that jockey's life. Believe me, Doctor. You can be assured of my full cooperation. Anything that I can do to help you... Thank you. I'll need your help. Number one, I want eight or ten motion picture cameras to be placed at my disposal at the track. Yes. Number two, I want to inoculate the jockey who rides luxury against black widow poison. All right. And number three, this is for you, Inspector. Hmm? I'd like the following ladies and gentlemen in my living room this evening. Mr. and Mrs. Hutchins, Mr. and Mrs. Summers, and Nick Martell. Agreed? They'll be here. Good. Now I've got to run. Oh, Brad, our wedding. Goodbye, Paula. Oh, Brad, this will make a very interesting lawsuit. Non-payment of alimony plus breach of promise. <laughs> Hi, sweet. Did you inoculate Luxury's jockey? Yes, with a little difficulty. I always thought you used a hypodermic. Hmm. Well, well, what do we do now? Nothing. I've done everything I can. The boy will not be killed. You think Corrigan will catch the murderer? I know darn well he won't. And there they go! They're off, Paula. Grant, roll up your sleeve. Luxury's running sixth. What? Roll up your sleeve. What for? I'm going to inoculate you. Paula, what? Now, use your head, Brad. There have been two attempts on your life already. What's going to happen when a murderer discovers your reckless plans today? I hadn't thought of that. I don't want you killed, Brad. And believe me, when somebody catches, until somebody catches that murderer, you're not going to have one minute free from danger. Well, there's nothing I can do about it now. I brought only one dose of antitoxin. I gave that to the jockey. Oh. Oh. Well, in that case, let's enjoy the race. Coming down to the line of finish now with War Cloud and Luxury, War Cloud and Luxury. They're running neck and neck, and now Luxury is pulling away. It's Luxury and War Cloud, and Luxury is the winner by a hand. Well, Doc, there's your race. Nothing happened. Everything on the up and up. It's a moral victory for you, Inspector. And to the victor below. Oh! Oh! 
Oh, look out there. Holy smoke, it's luxury. He's running away. The jockey's off. He's lying out on the track. Come on, Inspector, quick. Right with you. All right, stand back there. Get back. Give the doctor room to work. Get back, I say. Get his shirt open. Oh, there it is. The black widow on his chest. Look out. Get it off him. Uh, oh. Well, there's your murderer, Inspector. Black widow spider. I gave Spike an antitoxin before. This is an antidote. Spike, you'll be all right. Tomorrow, you'll never know this happened. Oh, I apologize, Doc. I'd give a month's pay to know who put that on him. That won't be hard to find out. Wait till tonight. Leroy Hutchins? Present. Mrs. Hutchins? Yes. Nick Martell? I'm here. Paula Bradford? Oh, that's me. Uh, Here. Uh, Mr. Summers? Right here. And Mrs. Summers? Here. Uh, Now, if you don't mind, Inspector, Dr. Bradford, I'd like very much to know why we are here. Well, the uh, doc here had an idea. We figured out that you're all suspects, so we invited you all here. The one that didn't show up was our man, or woman. But unfortunately, you all showed up. Mm Mm-hmm. So that lets the police out of the party. Sorry to trouble you folks. Good night. Well, I guess we can all go now. Yes? You wish? Oh, please don't go. We're such a nice, cozy little group. Say, I'll tell you what. I've got something that might interest you. How would you like to see some pictures? Movies? Right here in the house? I think you might be interested. You're all racing people, and I've got some fine track scenes. I think you'll enjoy this. Sit down, everyone, won't you? Make yourself comfortable. All right. Soaks, uh, turn on the machine. Why, that's today's race. In the paddock. There's luxury. And there's workload. Exactly which is what you're really here to see. I still believe one of you to be guilty. Today, one of you planned another coup. Again, one of you tried to murder Luxury's jockey. We've proven that Eddie Sands was murdered. The same method was tried on Spike Salisbury this afternoon. The murder was committed by placing a capsule on the jockey's body containing a black widow spider. The heat of his body melted the capsule. The spider was released to bite the jockey, and the murder was completed. And in just a moment, you'll see the murderer himself, just before the race, putting the capsule on the jockey's back. That's you up there, Hutchins, leaning against the wall. Yes, yes, I went in for a moment. But he's nowhere near Spike, is he? Oh, look, there's Mr. Martell. He's close, all right. He's putting his hand on Spike's shoulder. Now, wait a minute. Don't try to pin anything on me. Mrs. Summers is patting Spike on the shoulder now. I didn't put anything on him. You can see. Look at yes, Summers. Yes, saw Mrs. Summers. It's all right. Why is he fixing Spike's shirt in the back? Lights! Why, his chair's empty. I'm over here, Doctor. I was leaving, but I noticed your friends are still outside. Now, if you'll all just move down to that end of the room, please. I've got you covered. That's fine. Congratulations, Doctor. Very clever of you. But you slipped up on one point, the motive. I wanted to ruin you, Martell, because I knew what you'd done to me. You took away from me the only thing in the world I cared for. I'd fix every race there was until you lost every cent you own. But that's all over, I swear. I'm going to kill you, Martell. And you too, my dear wife. And you, Dr. Bradford, for your inquisitiveness. I don't think you're going to kill anybody with that gun. It's loaded with blanks. Yes? Well, we'll see. I hope that statue over there isn't valuable. Get the gun, Nick! Oh, 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 it's Bradford! Grab Summers, grab Summers, boys. You got him, boss. Where's the doc? Hey, hey, doc! Doc! Oh, where's the doc? He's here. He's unconscious. Good. Well, what happened to him? Oh, oh I went to hit something with that boss and I made a mistake. Oh, oh, Brad Dot. Oh, look at his bump. Well, you look awfully cute, Brad. I like your bandage. Thanks. The bow looks wonderful. What bow? On the bandage. It was all my idea. Yes, I imagine it was. No. No one else would bother with it. Well? Well? Now, what about us getting married? Oh, uh, Paula, I wouldn't walk across this room. Any other time, I'd be glad to, but tonight I wouldn't walk across this room to marry you. Well, would you walk halfway across? Uh, now you're quibbling. Yes or no, would you? Halfway, huh? Well, all right. Just to prove that the age of gallantry isn't dead. Yeah, I'll walk halfway. All right, come on. There. I walked halfway. That lets me out. Not yet. 
Don't start the movies. Very good, ma'am. That's another idea of mine. See? Talkies. That fellow's a real justice of the peace. Huh? My friends, we are gathered here to join together this man and this woman in the state of matrimony. Do you, Paula Bradford, take this man to be your husband? I do. And do you, Lawrence Bradford, take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? I do. And may heaven have mercy on my soul. Casting off their detective disguises, William Powell and Claudette Colbert return for a curtain call. Bill, as a forgotten man, how do you... Pardon me, C.B., that shadow over there in the corner, it looks like a man. Now, wait a minute, just a minute, Claudette, I'll do no more detecting tonight. Oh, but it may be a dangerous prowler of some kind. Where's the shadow, Claudette? Oh, there, by the curtain. Doesn't it look like a man? Oh, it does. He, he works here. Oh. Well, you can't be right all the time, but, Claudette... I think you have a suspicious nature. No, not in most things. But among the things I don't like are strange shadows on the wall or strange soaps. That's why I've used Lux soap for years. I know I can depend on it. Now, but what was that I, I interrupted a while back, C.B.? You were saying something about Bill as a forgotten man. I was about to ask him how he liked working for me in a picture. Working for you, Cecil? <laughs> I've, I've worked with just about every director in Hollywood except you. You have a scene in my last picture. Did Bill play one of the Indians? <laughs> no. No, Bill plays a tramp who lives in the city dump. A very charming tramp. Oh, yes, that was my man Godfrey. Only you didn't direct that, Cecil. No, but I used a scene from it in Land of Liberty. The picture which will be Hollywood's contribution to the New York World's Fair and the Golden Gate International Exposition in San Francisco. What else is in the picture, C.B.? Well, it's made of scenes dramatizing American history, taken from 124 pictures dating back as far as 1910. And a good deal of modern history as seen through the eye of the newsreel camera. Land of Liberty will not be shown anywhere for profit. And for the present, only at the two fairs. A picture like that should be a pretty valuable document, C.B., even if I am in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it'll still be more interesting 20 years from now. I hope I can see it at one of the fairs. Well, good night, C.B. Good night, Cecil. Uh, you'll, you'll hear from us again the moment we need a couple of good detectives. <laughs> Mr. DeMille returns in just a moment with news about next week's stars and play. Heard in the ex-Mrs. Bradford were John Archer as Nick Martell, Alice Eden as Mrs. Summers, Norman Field as Mr. Summers, Colin Campbell as Stokes, Ray Appleby as Mike North, Ross Forrester as Mr. Frankenstein, Frank Nelson as morgue attendant, John Fee as Mr. Hutchins, Martha Wentworth as Mrs. Hutchins, David Kerman as Mr. Pender, Lou Merrill as Inspector Corrigan, and Bob Burleson as Mr. Curtis. Tonight's play was filmed by RKO Studio, producers of the new picture, Career. Lewis Silvers appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studio. He directed music there for Susanna of the Mounties. Be sure to listen to the Lux Daytime Radio program. It tells you the enthralling story of the love and problems of a young, attractive woman doctor. Look in your newspapers for the time and station every afternoon, Monday through Friday. The life and love of Dr. Susan comes to you in addition to the Lux Radio Theater. Mr. DeMille. On the eve of her wedding, a girl makes a wish that she may never grow old. From that day on, she watches time leave its mark on all that she loves, while she herself never changes. This is the theme of the play you'll hear next Monday night, a play called Mrs. Moonlight, with two splendid artists in the starring roles, Janet Gaynor and George Brent. Since the beginning of time, men and women have searched for the secret of eternal youth. Listen next Monday and learn of one who finds that secret and of how she uses it. We have just been advised that the readers of Radio Guide magazine have selected the Lux Radio Theater as the best dramatic program on the air. We are grateful to all who participated in this poll. And to Radio Guide magazine for the medal symbolizing the honor. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Janet Gaynor and George Brent in Mrs. Moonlight. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>